Welcome to Feminist for Mothers, a mama film podcast. I'm your host, Emily Christensen. You are listening to a series about the cultural legacies of three very complicated women, Carrie Nation, Hattie McDaniel, and Rosie the Riveter. Each made history, and they still exert a surprising amount of influence today. In this episode, we're going to cover factory workers, a league of their own, and that one poster you see absolutely everywhere. This is episode three, Rosie the Riveter, American Goddess. I'm recording this in May of 2021, and we're in the middle of recovering from a pandemic that has exposed the tenuous position of American women at work. Over the past year, women have left the workforce in far greater numbers than men and women with racialized identities have been impacted the most. We can do it, the sentiment attributed to Rosie the Riveter, rings a bit hollow in light of this recent news. Even so, Rosie the Riveter is the most iconic image of American womanhood, one full of contradictions. For one, she didn't start as an image at all. So how did we come to worship at Rosie's altar? Before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about Mama Film. In 2019, Leela Meadow Connor brought independent movies by and about women to her microcinema in Wichita, Kansas. Since then, she's collaborated on projects such as the Repro Film Festival and the Mothership Screenwriters Lab. This podcast was launched as part of Mama Film's 2021 partnership with the Sundance Film Festival. To learn more about Mama Film and to purchase tickets for upcoming shows, visit mama.film. Part 1. Working for Victory Red Evans and John Jacob Loeb are the men responsible for introducing Rosie the Riveter to the world. Evans and Loeb's hit song, and epic earworm, was released by the Four Vagabonds in early 1943. It doesn't mention anything about coveralls or a kerchief, or bulging muscles or even beauty. It doesn't mention Rosie's appearance at all. In a later verse from the original song, we do learn that while she's not frivolous, Rosie still manages to be popular and fun to be around. But mostly she's committed to the war effort. After the United States entered World War II, women stepped into all kinds of jobs once held by men. My grandmother, Margaret Elizabeth Price Kohler, took on her brother's rural mail route after he left for military service. On occasion, her old Ford would slide into a ditch and she'd have to be rescued by someone passing by. Leona Morgan worked as a press break operator in Boeing's Wichita factory. She was also raising two daughters and helping her mother. She carpooled 68 miles a day to her job. Then after work, she canned food and cared for more than 100 chickens. Catherine Abraham went to work at Boeing when she was in her early 40s. She took a factory shift opposite her husband and oldest daughter, and that's how they managed childcare for the younger children. Every day before leaving for the night shift, Abraham made dinner for her family. The surge in women in the workforce was most dramatic in aviation, where women had made up 1% of workers before the war. In 1943, they held 65% of all aviation jobs. More than 310,000 women worked in the aircraft industry. Quite a few of them worked in factories in Wichita, where Boeing, Cessna, and Beechcraft all built planes for the military. 
Of course, you won't be surprised to hear that many folks were bothered about the idea of women taking jobs traditionally held by men. And there was all kinds of fretting about its implications, both moral and practical. Would the children of America suffer? And were women even capable of doing sheet metal work at all? What is surprising, and kind of hilarious, is how clueless government and industry leadership was. For example, initially women were subject to height and weight restrictions. They couldn't be taller than 5 feet 2 inches or weigh more than 135 pounds. This does not make sense, and the rule didn't last. Boeing officials publicly expressed skepticism that women were capable of factory work, even as they were hiring women to build their planes, which would include the B-29 bomber. At one point, the company organized physical fitness classes for the women working in their factories. These were short-lived. I guess women were already successfully doing these jobs, and they thought it was a waste of their time. In 1942, the War Manpower Commission announced plans for a National Defense Training School in Wichita. It was located on Waco Avenue and prepared both men and women for factory work. The following year, the commission reported an acute labor shortage. City officials organized a sheet metal class for girls attending Wichita East High School. That allowed them to start factory work immediately after graduation. Most women held entry-level positions and were supervised by men who didn't qualify for military service. Doris Massey Buckner was an exception. In high school, she convinced the principal to let her take drafting and woodshop classes. She was eventually promoted to the role of inspector at Boeing, although she said her male colleagues largely ignored her. A woman she worked with suggested that Doris wear her hair on top of her head in order to give her a little bit more height, and presumably an air of authority. Factory wages were quite a bit higher than typical women's jobs, such as working in laundries, shops, or in homes as domestic workers. Still, they were paid far less than men. The wage gap varied, but in aircraft, women earned about half what men did. There was racial discrimination, too. Most black factory workers, men and women, held lower-paying custodial jobs. There were a small number of black line workers in Wichita, though. Connie Palacios was a Chicana riveter for Boeing who worked in tandem with Jerry Warden, a black woman. Connie remembered that some of the other women didn't want to work so closely with Jerry. Julia Scott Nelson was another black member of the factory line who often paired up with her sister. Women factory workers in Wichita came from all walks of life. They grew up nearby or were farm girls from Kansas and Oklahoma. Others moved to the growing factory town because of the demand for workers. They were married and single mothers and childless. Many were married to or dating men in the military. In my research into women's experiences working in Wichita aircraft factories, I was struck by how many talked about the different kinds of people they met. For some, it was the first time they realized that other women's lives looked quite a bit different than their own. This makes sense. As a woman in the 40s, you probably didn't have a car, didn't travel, didn't go to college. You'd probably live with your parents until you got married. Many millions of Americans migrated, usually due to poverty or racism or both, but far more stuck close to home, growing old in the same communities where they were born. It's no wonder that you could make it to adulthood without much sense of regional or cultural differences. For the hundreds of thousands of women whom Rosie the Riveter represents, the Second World War changed that for good. Part 2. That Old Story The 1992 movie A League of Their Own is about another type of Rosie, the kind who runs bases instead of assembly lines. The first feature-length interpretation of the Rosie the Riveter narrative is the largely forgettable 1944 romantic comedy of the same name. But A League of Their Own is the greatest of all Rosie stories. Allow me to explain. The movie is a fictionalized account of the Rockford Peaches, a real women's professional baseball team. They played in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, organized while many Major League Baseball players were serving in World War II. Despite heavy skepticism, the women proved they're more than capable of doing a man's job. Sound familiar? The All-American Girls succeed despite the odds. But just as they've turned doubters into fans, the war looks as though it might be coming to a close. At this moment, the league's founder, Walter Harvey, attends a game with the general manager, Ira Lowenstein. Harvey is loosely based on Philip K. Wrigley, the Cubs owner who founded the league. 
He's played by Gary Marshall and Lowenstein by David Strathairn. Look at this crowd. This is great. They're jumping, they're hopping, they're cheering, and they paid to get in here. You did a fabulous job, Ira. I won't forget this. Oh, thank you, Mr. Harvey. Thank you very much. I appreciate it coming from you. But to, uh, to be perfectly honest, I think the girls deserve most of the credit. Oh, they're great. Fortunately, we won't need them anymore. Do you want a peanut? No. What do you mean? What do you mean, what do I mean? We're winning the war. Our situation changed. I mean, Roosevelt himself said men's baseball won't be shut down. So we won't need the girls next year. Bases loaded, the bottom of the ninth. Rockford up six to two, two men out. No balls, two strikes. This is what it's going to be like in the factories, too, I suppose, isn't it? Men are back, Rosie. Turn in your rivets. We told them it was their patriotic duty to get out of the kitchen and go to work. And now when the men come back, we'll send them back to the kitchen. What should we do? Send the boys returning from war back to the kitchen? Come on. Harvey's attitude reflects the prevailing sentiment of the 1940s. Technically, it was illegal for a company to replace a woman with a returning soldier, but staying with the factory didn't feel like an option to most women, who felt pressure to give up their jobs. A League of Their Own is also full of visual references to Rosie. In one scene, we see a wartime recruitment poster hanging in the broadcast booth. I found the job where I fit best. Find your war job in industry, agriculture, business. Ace Rockford Peaches pitcher Dottie Henson, played by Gina Davis, lands on the cover of Life magazine, invoking the many photos of women war workers that ran a weekly such as Life in the Saturday Evening Post. Even Rosie's iconic headgear makes an appearance. In the scene where Dottie and her sister Kit have a knockdown, drag out fight, Dottie sports a kerchief tied just like Rosie's, with curls peeking out from underneath. Perhaps the most rosy part of the film is the theme of gender anxiety. Beauty lessons are part of the Peaches' training, and skirts are part of their uniform. They had to live up to a male standard of athletic achievement, but still look cute at all times. The implication? That was the price women had to pay if they wanted to play ball. In January 1943, the Wichita Eagle published a cartoon about women's new job opportunities. A gigantic woman towers over a house. She's wearing overalls, and her hair is tucked into a cap. A lunchbox in one hand, a mallet in the other. Her pockets bulge with more tools, and a packet labeled, Her Own Man-Sized Pay Envelope. At her feet is a tiny man holding a skillet and a broom, calling out, But remember, you gotta come back as soon as the war is over. The giantess replies, Oh yeah? The cartoon is captioned, letting the genie out of the bottle. It's not a coincidence that the cartoon woman looks like she might crush the tiny man beneath her enormous shoe. People were genuinely worried about the horrific consequences of women's work. Some of the loudest voices were women, including officers of the Women's Auxiliary of the American Legion. In A League of Their Own, this intense anxiety is voiced by a deliciously cartoonish radio personality. And now, from Chicago, the Mutual presents another social commentary by Ms. Maida Gillespie. Careers in higher education are leading to the masculinization of women with enormously dangerous consequences to the home, the children, and our country. When our boys come home from war, what kind of girls will they be coming home to? And now, the most disgusting example of this sexual confusion, Mr. Walter Harvey of Harvey Bars is presenting us with women's baseball. Right here in Chicago, young girls plucked from their families are gathered at Harvey Field to see which one of them can be the most masculine. Mr. Harvey, like your candy bars, you are completely 
A League of Their Own is framed by a 90s-era reunion of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. In the opening scenes, Dottie's adult daughter is trying to get her out the door. Honey, I'm not comfortable about this. I'm not really part of it. It was never that important to me. It was just something I did. That's all. Mom, when are you going to realize how special it was? How much it all meant? The final scenes of the film take place at the reunion, and we watch Dottie's slow realization that her baseball career was part of something much bigger than herself. Yes, I cry every time. But as schmaltzy as these scenes are, Dottie's ownership of her own experience rings true. It's reflected in the interviews with countless women who held factory jobs during the war. They didn't change everything, and many went on to lead fairly conventional lives. But they moved the needle a little bit, and their daughters and granddaughters took it further. And we're still working on it. Almost 80 years after the U.S. entered World War II, we're still trying to figure out how to close the wage gap and support mothers who work a double shift inside and outside their home. A League of Their Own says pretty much everything about Rosie the Riveter. The women who embodied her spirit came from different backgrounds and took on new roles for various reasons, some of them intensely personal. A number of them managed to be both fierce and ultra-femme, while others chafed under traditional gender expectations. Ultimately, the ladies cast in Rosie's image were simply regular women. And like a lot of regular women, it took some time for them to be acknowledged, to understand their own impact. We've been telling the Rosie story for decades now. You'd think it would be wearing thin. But as long as we're still wrestling with Rosie's contradictions, there's plenty of juice there. Here's a rundown from the past year. The short documentary The Girl with the Rivet Gun was on the festival circuit. It uses stop-motion animation to illustrate the stories of three Rosies. Karen Sonora superimposed the Rosie the Riveter aesthetic on the Greek myth of the sirens for her film Mayday, a 2021 Sundance selection. The heroine is trapped in a fantastical world wherein beautiful women in coveralls lure men to their deaths. Talk about gender anxiety. And then last year brought this exciting news from The Hollywood Reporter. Amazon has handed out a series order for its reboot of A League of Their Own months after wrapping production on the pilot. Broad City's Abby Jacobson and Will Graham created the hour-long series, which is described as a reinterpretation of the original nearly 30-year-old feature film about the real-life All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Jacobson will star in the series alongside a terrific lineup that includes Darcy Carden and Roberta Calendris. I'm looking forward to the new generation of the Rockford Peaches. Part 3. The Many Faces of Rosie Norman Rockwell, the popular painter of American everyday life, gave Rosie the Riveter physical form. His painting appeared on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post in May of 1943. It depicts a muscular young woman pausing to eat a sandwich, a riveting gun resting in her lap, her safety goggles and hood pushed up to her temples. The image is hyper-patriotic. An American flag floods the background. The woman wears a victory pin on her overalls, and her foot rests on a copy of Mein Kampf, Hitler's manifesto. The lettering on her lunch pail identifies her as Rosie. She doesn't look entirely unlike the giantess in the newspaper cartoon. But of course, this isn't the image we think about when we think about Rosie the Riveter. We're more than 20 minutes into this podcast, and I've barely talked about what Rosie the Riveter looks like because I don't have to. You know exactly what I'm talking about. An ethnically ambiguous white woman wearing a red and white polka dot kerchief over perfectly coiffed hair. Her left arm raised in a gesture somewhere between a bodybuilder's bicep pose and a friendly up yours. A conversation bubble above her reads, we can do it, exclamation point for emphasis. In 2019, Saturday Night Live sketched out an origin story for the iconic poster. While the men fight in Germany, America's women head to the factories to do their part. Well, sir, I am honored you chose our factory to find the face of your new campaign. The We Can Do It poster needs a gal who embodies the can-do spirit of America's women. Well, these gals have that in spades. Uh, This is Rosie, a riveter. 
Pleased to meet you, sir. Hmm. Rosie the Riveter. Say, that's got a nice ring to it. Hmm. The setup aligns with what we think we know about how Rosie came to be. But the We Can Do It poster wasn't a piece of government propaganda or even a workforce recruiting ad. It was just meant to encourage factory employees of the Westinghouse Corporation. One of at least 42 posters that freelance artist J. Howard Miller produced for the company, the one we think of as Rosie the Riveter hung in Westinghouse factories for just 13 days in February of 1943. It's possible that fewer than 1,000 We Can Do It posters were printed and hung on Westinghouse factory floors. Very few people actually saw this iconic poster in the 40s. And yet, somehow, it's everywhere. In 1999, the image appeared on a U.S. postage stamp. It's a staple of T-shirts, greeting cards, and gift shops, especially those with a connection to science, technology, or aviation. For example, a corner of the Kansas Aviation Museum gift shop is devoted to rosy paraphernalia. Over the years, many celebrities have adopted the image. In 2010, photographer Derek Blanks captured Kelly Rowland as Rosie for his Alter Ego series. Pink performs Rosie Drag in the music video for her hit single, Raise Your Glass, also released in 2010. Rowland's former Destiny's Child bandmate Beyonce, maybe you've heard of her, struck a Rosie pose in a 2014 Instagram post. When she hosted Saturday Night Live in 2016, Ronda Rousey appeared as Rosie in a promotional image. Also in 2016, Kendall Jenner dressed as Rosie in her capacity as a spokesperson for Rock the Vote. Not to be outdone, Keeping Up with the Kardashians matriarch Kris Jenner added her own Rosie picture to Instagram. Countless other public figures have been Rosie-fied, my term for having your likeness grafted onto the Rosie persona. Just in the past few months, I've encountered Rosie-fied versions of Stacey Abrams, Kamala Harris, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So you might be wondering, if the World War II audience for J. Howard Miller's iconic poster was limited to Westinghouse employees, how did it become one of the United States' most important pieces of visual culture? And how did it become associated with Rosie the Riveter? Fifteen years ago, a couple of academics traced the origin and reappearance of the We Can Do It poster. James J. Kimball and Lester C. Olson call the woman on the poster a modern-day myth. They challenged the assumption that the woman on the poster is Rosie the Riveter at all. After all, while Westinghouse had war contracts, the company didn't even employ Riveters. So yeah, how did this poster become synonymous with both Rosie and women's contributions to the war effort? Well, friends, this is where we reveal the real superheroes. Librarians. J. Howard Miller's poster wasn't widely circulated before the 1980s, but it was preserved in the National Archives. The first published reference to the poster may have been in a 1982 Washington Post story about souvenir posters that were then available from the archives. It popped up again three years later, and eventually the image just snowballed. People made assumptions about its origins, assumptions that often made their way into magazine articles or blog posts. The Ad Council even claimed it was their work. In their paper about the We Can Do It poster, Kimball and Olson do an admirable job of disambiguation. But while J. Howard Miller may not have set out to make a portrait of Rosie the Riveter exactly, he employed visual references commonly used in illustrations of women war workers. A poster labeled It's Our Fight Too, issued by the Douglas Aircraft Company around the same time, depicts a bekerchiefed woman holding a rivet gun. Many cartoons from the 40s portray female factory workers wearing overalls or boiler suits their hair secured with a handkerchief. The woman on the We Can Do It poster may not be Rosie the Riveter exactly, but the song, along with the various posters, the Norman Rockwell painting, and the cartoons, all circle the same archetype. It's so clear and well-defined that we can spot it in a movie about a baseball team. In her illustration for this podcast, artist Hannah Scott constructed a portrait of Rosie using elements of her identity. She wears green overalls over a mustard brown shirt, and a coordinating green kerchief holds back her hair. In her hands is a rivet gun, and her expression falls somewhere between confidence and uncertainty. It's a different image, but she's still clearly rosy. Ultimately, the Westinghouse We Can Do It poster is a paradox. 
It had little impact when it was produced, yet it's one of the most powerful images in American history. The sheer popularity of this one image likely inspired a renewed interest in women's civilian service during World War II. It's almost certainly responsible for much of the research conducted since the 90s. Similarly, a league of their own inspired curiosity about the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League and the more than 600 women who were pioneers of women's pro sports. Surviving members of the league have given credit to director Penny Marshall for securing their place in history. We may have imposed a false narrative onto J. Howard Miller's We Can Do It poster, but if we hadn't, we'd know so much less about the women it came to represent. Part 4. The Way Forward. World War II Rosies exposed a critical weakness in our nation's infrastructure, child care. Because they had to pull double duty as primary caregivers to children and elderly adults, women were absent from work more often than men. In a 1943 newspaper cartoon, a factory inspector gags at the sight of two little boys tucked into bomb casings. A rosy type says, It's either this or days off until we can get a nursery organized. A poster on the wall reads, Absenteeism aids Adolf. Keep on the job. And another, Beat the quota. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt advocated the passage of a law that created the first federally funded child care centers. By 1943, there were four of these facilities located near the aircraft factories in South Wichita. The pandemic affirmed that many women can't effectively participate in the workforce without adequate assistance with child care and paid family leave, two aspects of the social safety net where the U.S. lags far behind much of the rest of the world. As sociologist Jessica Colarco has said, other countries have a social safety net. The U.S. has women. This lack of resources has devastating effects on the careers of individual women, of course, especially single mothers and Black, Indigenous, and women of color. But it also drains the American workforce of an enormous pool of talent. Research indicates that companies that employed more women in senior roles perform better. Arguably, just like during the Second World War, industry can't afford to ignore women's needs. For the past year, management consulting firm McKinsey has been conducting research into this issue, in collaboration with Lean In. They've come up with a few suggestions. One is to adjust child care policies to provide more support. Companies should also take an intersectional approach that acknowledges the challenges faced by single mothers and women with marginalized identities. Finally, McKinsey suggests resetting norms around flexibility to give women more tools to balance their varied responsibilities. The sad truth is that workplace progress for women often comes when there's no other choice. Women worked in factories during World War II because of a severe labor shortage. The United States needed aircraft companies to build bombers for the war effort, and that was going to happen even if it had to be women who riveted and ran presses. In an increasingly competitive global economy, is the prospect of better performance enough to change norms and laws to ensure more equity for women? It's a far more abstract challenge than defeating Hitler and the Axis powers. Hopefully, the pandemic has made the crisis a bit more clear to everyone. Epilogue. Follow, unfollow, or pause for 30 days. In each episode of our three-part mini-season, we've asked ourselves how each foremother would present on social media. Prohibitionist Carrie Nation, who dropped catchphrases like they were going out of style, would clearly gravitate to Twitter. Actress Hattie McDaniel would be a natural on TikTok. And obviously, Rosie the Riveter's rightful place is on Instagram. Those Beyonce and Kardashian Rosie posts are excellent stories content for one thing. She could save them to a story highlights category called imitation. I would definitely follow that. We call each of our four mothers complicated, but as an archetype slash icon, Rosie is especially complicated. I want to follow her in order to hear more stories about the women she represented. And then there are days when I need that badass, Amy Cuddy power pose energy, or at least I think I do. There's also the many ways in which Rosie's persona is intriguingly queer-coded. However, there are definitely reasons to take a break from this particular feminist influencer. The belief that we can do it all, full stop, ignores the larger picture, including the value of women's unpaid labor. No one loves a martyr, Rosie. She also kind of reminds me of people who are intensely focused on their personal brand. I mean, give it a rest sometimes. 
There is an alternative to unfollowing Rosie, though. Simply look at her from a different angle and catch a glimpse of another woman entirely. Thanks for listening to Feminist Foremothers, a Mama Film podcast. Feminist Foremothers is written and hosted by Emily Christensen, produced by Emily Christensen and Leela Meadow-Connor, and edited by Kylie Brown. Hannah Scott made portraits of each foremother for this podcast. You can find me on Twitter at ShmemilyEmily, Shmemily spelled S-C-H-M-E-M-I-L-Y. Find a complete transcript and check out our show notes at mama.film. The show notes include links to the books, movies, and articles discussed in this episode. These include three sources I relied on heavily for this podcast. They are Beyond Rosie the Riveter, Women of World War II and American Popular Graphic Art by Donna P. Naff, which contains most of the visual references to Rosie that I describe in the podcast. Visual Rhetoric Representing Rosie the Riveter, Myth and Misconception in J. Howard Miller's We Can Do It poster by James J. Kimball and Lester C. Olson, traces the weird history of the We Can Do It poster. And Uncle Sam wanted them too, women aircraft workers in Wichita during World War II. Historian Judith R. Johnson collected stories from women who worked in Wichita aircraft factories during the war. If you enjoy this podcast, please spread the word and check out our other episodes about Carrie Nation and Hattie McDaniel at mama.film.